Hi everyone. I mentioned in a recent video that my ex had died, not my most recent ex, but the ex before that. Um, and I sort of said it offhandedly without really thinking about it because I assumed that most people were already familiar with the story. And then I realized that a lot of people who are watching these videos probably followed me since then, so they might not be familiar with that story because it happened a long time ago. It was almost a year now. It was a June of last year. So I thought that it might be a good idea to make a video where I tell that story again and go through everything that happened in detail um, for the people who may not know what I'm talking about because it was a very formative thing that happened to me and it's very crucial for you to know about what happened if you were going to understand who I am as a person. Um, so that being said, please, I would ask that people not make jokes or insensitive crude remarks because this was a real person and this was a real thing that happened. I don't really care that much, but you never know who might be watching this who, you know, could have a problem with it. So just try to be sensitive to those people. Um, also, before I tell the story, I really should, I want to make it very clear that I am aware that this story makes me seem like a bad person. But you have to remember that we are looking at it with the benefit of hindsight. And as they say, hindsight is always 2020, right? So um, when you're going through something, you are not thinking about how your behavior is going to seem when you're telling the story a year later. So just try to keep that in mind. Um, okay, so June 2023. Uh, this whole thing really starts with I guess, one video that I made. Um, at that time, I had been making sort of uh, short-form TikToks about relationship advice. They were kind of like uh, life hacks. So I would give people little tips and tricks uh, that would sort of help them in their relationship and help uh, make their relationship easier, basically. And I drew on my experience as a couples therapist um, to come up with these ideas. They went really Everybody really loved them. They went very well. Um, one video in particular that I made was about how um, I used to... I have to be very careful about how I explain this because it's one of those things where people freak out if I explain it the wrong way and they don't understand what I'm trying to say. I used to put salt in my partner's Brita filter water without them knowing because that would cause them to become dehydrated and this would make it the symptoms of dehydration would make them more susceptible to being manipulated again i'm aware that it sounds bad but what you have to remember is that that was a totally different cultural moment we are, it was a, the zeitgeist was completely different. If you ever watch, I recently watched the movie Airplane, which is a very funny movie, but it came out in the 60s, you know, in the 70s. And so some of the things that they said in that movie were so horrifically offensive that you, you cannot even possibly fathom a world where that would be acceptable because in our current world, it is not. Um, but at the time, it was a totally different culture. And uh, so I made that video and I posted it and you know, it did okay. Nothing really, it wasn't anything to write home about. So I kind of moved on with my life. The next day I was working from home because at, at that time I worked from home and I lived with my ex. Um, but I, that it did, I didn't treat working at home like some people treated where they just kind of leave their laptop open on their desk and then they go to the beach. Um, I worked very, very diligently. So I would start at around 8 a.m., turn my phone on do not disturb mode so then I knew nobody would bother me, and I would work steadily through the day until around 5, at which point I'd turn my phone off, do not disturb. Um, and I made it very clear to everyone in my life that you cannot bother me at work, but treat it like I am at an actual job. And I was very, very careful to design my life so that there was no possible way that anybody could ever need me in an emergency. Um, so I was working that day and I got to about lunchtime, 
where I took a short 15 minute break and I turned my phone off, do not disturb. And I see that I had a bunch of missed texts from my partner, my ex, uh, who uh, that was all about them saying, you know, I don't feel good at blah, blah, blah. And my ex was a real party animal. So they used to constantly be staying out until the middle of the wee hours of the morning, um, doing God knows what. They were always on something or off something or hungover or, you know. Um, point is, it would have been more unusual if they had been feeling well. So I didn't think too much of this either. I didn't even answer. I just, you know, turned my do not disturb back on and then went back to work. Um, I finished work a little early that day, around three to four in the afternoon because I had been in a really good flow. So I got a lot done. And uh, turned my phone off, do not disturb mode. It's confusing to say that, you know, because he's, because my phone was technically going on, but it, I was turning do not disturb mode off. Um, I turned off do not disturb mode. So I turned my phone on, if you want to look at it that way. Um, and almost immediately I got a call from an unknown number. And because of the nature of my career, because I'm in Hollywood and I'm, uh, you know, in the entertainment industry and I've got all sorts of irons in the fire at any given point, I always pick up unknown numbers because what if, you know, I decline an unknown number and it turns out that it was Steven Spielberg, right? And, and you know, I missed my shot at my big break. So I picked it up and lady on the other line says, hello, we're calling from the hospital. Um, your partner is in critical condition in the ICU and you're their emergency contact. So I immediately hang up because I assumed that it was a spam call. Like I think anybody would in that situation, because why the hell would that ever happen to somebody? Um, also I should mention, I did not know that I was their emergency contact. They never asked me that. And if they had asked me, I probably would have said no, because I'm trying to avoid this exact situation. I feel like there's, that's got to be illegal somehow that I'm on the hook for anything that could possibly happen, even though I didn't agree to that. Um, so the same number calls me back again and again. And I'm thinking that this is a really persistent, you know, they're calling me decline, call, decline over and over. Finally, I answer again, for the sole purpose of screaming at them to get them to leave me the hell alone. And I say, fuck off. I am going to call the police if you call me one more time. Shut up. I'm not buying your stupid snake oil crap, whatever it is. I'm not some old person who you're going to trick into your stupid scam. So go fuck yourself and go kill yourself, honestly. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that on YouTube, but we're going to find out, right? <laughs> um, so they... Somebody hands the phone to someone else. I sort of hear the phone switch over and I kind of hear something that sounds like maybe somebody's crying and, and a deeper voice gets on the phone and says, Mr. Henschel, um, your partner, and they say their name. I don't want to say their name because I want to protect their privacy, but the name was right. And uh, the information was all correct. They said, uh, your partner is in the hospital, they're in the ICU, they're in critical condition, it's not looking good, so you need to come down right away because you're their emergency contact. And so then, of course, you know, once I realize that this is a real situation and I grasp the urgency of what's happening, of course, I immediately run out the door and I run into my car and I start making a TikTok because um, I'm a content creator and my bread and butter is my content. So um, think about it like this. What if during the time that I was going to be at the hospital, I would have otherwise come up with the next kombucha girl meme or whatever, something that could have, again, uh, been my big break. What if that was going to happen and that now it's not going to happen because I'm going to go to the stupid hospital? So I tried to take this opportunity to both communicate to people why I was probably going to be available for the next couple hours and unavailable. Did I say that? Unavailable for the next couple hours. Um, and because honestly, yeah, I kind of wanted it to go viral. Who doesn't want to go viral, right? Because the only good things would come from that situation. They probably would have paid money for the GoFundMe. You know, they would have... Um, I, Maybe it could have got on the news 
And then that could have been good for my career too. So you never know. So I said, sure, yeah, why not? It didn't take very long. I'm, you remember, I'm a content machine, so I can just crank this stuff out. So it took maybe a couple seconds to film it and upload it. Um, people, of course, gave me all sorts of crap for that, but people have a problem with every single thing they see on the internet, so whatever. I don't even care anymore. Once I was done making the video, then, of course, I head straight to the hospital. And on the way, I stop at McDonald's to get some dinner because I'm hungry. This is another thing that people really had a problem with. Like I said, people have a problem with every single thing they see on the internet. But remember, I had not really eaten anything pretty much all day. I hadn't eaten anything since lunch. So I was very, very hungry. And if you don't eat, you can die, literally. So I, I figure somebody's already in the hospital. What's the point of having two people in the hospital now? So I've got to eat something. I Again, I thought it was supposed to be fast food. That's why they call it fast food. So I thought it was going to be quick. But I had forgotten that, well, I, I don't even know why I would have known this at all because it shouldn't exist. But it was Grimace's birthday that day. So that it, Grimace is their purple. You know what? I'm not even going to explain it because they're not even giving me any money anyway. So who gives a shit about their brand relevance? Um, it was a McDonald's. They were giving a bunch of discounts, you know. So there were a lot of people going to McDonald's. It's the short version of that, everything that I just said. So the line was very long. And it was too late for me to do anything because the way that particular drive through is designed... When you get in, there's somebody behind, or there's somebody in front of you, and then there's somebody behind you, and then on either side of you, there's bushes and a curb. So you literally can't get out once you're in. You're stuck there. So the only option I had was to go fully through the drive through And if I'm going to do that, I'm going to get food. You know, I might as well. Um, while I'm in the line, two things happen. The first, I get a call from a woman named Susan Cracker. Now, I do not have time to explain the odyssey that is attached to that name. If you follow me on Instagram and you have for a long time, you probably know what I'm talking about. And I cannot even give you a brief summary of it because even that would take 40 minutes. So I may make another video where I explain all that stuff. Um, but for now, you don't need to worry about it. It's not relevant to this story. Um, the second thing that happened was I get a text from the United States Postal Service, and they say that they have delivered a package to my doorstep that I had been expecting, which was a custom printed T-shirt. Um, I live in Highland Park, Los Angeles, which is an extremely dangerous neighborhood. So if I do not pick up my package as soon as it's delivered, some thief is going to come steal it. So... It's a custom printed t-shirt. It's a once one of a kind item. So I have to, I'm like, I gotta go home. I gotta at least bring it inside, you know? So I didn't live too far away from the McDonald's and I figured I would have time to go, go home, maybe go to the bathroom, you know, to, whatever. Of course, because McDonald's took so long, now it's rush hour. So it takes me another hour to get back home from the McDonald's. And I figure once I get there, I'm like, okay, well, Honestly, it might be, this situation might be less urgent than I had initially thought because um, when the, the hospital, according to the hospital, my ex was in a coma, so they were unconscious. And I figured it's, I mean, I might as well wait because then at least there's a better chance that my partner will be awake when I get there. And, I'm, I, you know, it, if I show up and they're in a coma, what am I going to do besides look at them? Um so at least if they're awake when I get there, I'll have something to do. So I so I waited a little. I figured I can wait a lot. I've got some time to kill. I go inside. Um, and I you kind of do You know, I go to the bathroom because I've been in traffic for two hours. And and um, I post a couple pictures of, of the shirt. I want to make sure that it turned out okay. So I open the package up and I do a little fashion show and all this, all this stuff. Um, plus, the other good part about waiting is that I'm going to wait for the rush hour traffic to sort of subside. I don't even know why I'm defending myself because I think I'm just so traumatized from people having a problem with every single thing that I do. Just in the past two weeks, I've had two life-destroying controversies. Um, so sorry if I'm a little defensive, but 
you would be too if you were me and everybody, every single thing you say, people take it completely out of context and run with it like Lassie and try to destroy your whole life. Anyway, um, I, around eight, eight or nine, I think it was around eight, I, I said, okay, it's probably okay if I go to the hospital now. Traffic's not going to be so bad. I go to the hospital. It takes me about an hour to get there. Um, and so now it's around nine, nine thirty. This is the same hospital, and this is the reason why I'm even why I even brought up this whole story in the first place, and why I'm bothering to explain it. Because um, my ex-wife's daughter, that whole thing that happened a couple weeks ago, was also at this hospital, and it was the same hospital staff, which is a basically a gang of people who. Hospital staff are probably some of the most annoying people on the planet because they have convinced themselves that because they have Munchausen by proxy syndrome, that means that they're good people when really they're just glorified waiters. Um, so they have a sort of really off-putting sense of self-righteousness. And I just want to, you know, sorry if you're a member of a hospital staff, but honestly, try to think about what I'm saying and see if you can maybe be better and encourage your uh, colleagues to be better as well. Um, point is, this is the same hospital that I've dealt with now twice. Um, I go to the hospital and I can tell that the second I walk in there, they have already decided that they don't like me for whatever reason. Um, and I say, I'm here to see my partner. Where the hell is my partner? And they say, well, you're not, since you're not a family member, we can't tell you that information. Um, and you can come back tomorrow during visitation hours and we'll be more than happy to tell you where your partner is. But until then, you're too late, basically. So I, I don't want to say I lost it because I had a very, I think, reasonable reaction given the situation. It's been hours now that I've been running all around town, all because my partner is in this stupid hospital. So, and now they're telling me that I might as well just go home and wait until tomorrow. When they're the ones who told me that it was such a big fucking deal in the first place. I told them, you're the ones who told me to come here. I took everything that was on the stupid receptionist's desk, cleared it off so that I'd be able to, so that she would listen to what the hell I was saying. And then I... Remember very vividly, there was a there was a one of those rolling trays with a bunch of syringes and hospital stuff on it. I took it and flipped it over because I'm trying to get everybody's attention. People are all running around. If you've ever been to a hospital, you know, people are running around doing all sorts of stuff and they're not, it's very hard to get through to anybody. So it sounds like I was freaking out and having a public meltdown, but I was trying to get everybody's attention so that they would listen to me because this was very important. Of course... Because the hospital staff was all white people and because they are part of the fascist um, militia that keeps us, you know, that they're part of the, uh, uh, what do you call it, the bourgeoisie, um, they call the police because they're in bed with the police, you know, and they're the ones who sort of have to push the boot down on our throats together. Um, and I say, you know what? If you're not going to tell me where my partner is, I'm just going to go find them. So I go through and I start opening everybody's door, running down the hallways, trying to figure out which room my partner is in. And this hospital is massive. It's probably maybe 10 buildings. So this is going to be quite an undertaking. I get through, you know, maybe the first building. And I am like, you know what? Forget it. I'm just going to go home. I'm so tired. I've been dealing with this all day. My partner's not going anywhere. They're probably still in a coma. They're just going to be in a, asleep anyway. Um, I might as well get some rest. I come back refreshed. And then it will be it will become clear to me what I have to do. So I go home. I sleep on it. And because I've been running around all day, I haven't really had much of a time to process what's been going on. It hasn't really sunk in. And once it does, I'm a very empathetic person. Let me just say that first and foremost. Um, so when somebody else who I love 
is dealing with something, I take on the full weight of their problem. And I feel it probably 10 times as much as they do because what I imagine they're going through is probably so much worse than what they're actually going through. If you've ever seen the movie Jaws, um, the shark doesn't show up in that movie for the first half. And that's what makes it so scary because you don't see the shark. And so you're imagining what the shark looks like. And it's probably scarier in your imagination than it is in the actual movie. Because then when you see it in the actual movie, it's just a stupid, you know, Muppet, basically. So point is, I'm having a, probably a worse time, arguably, than my partner is, who's just, you know, basically getting an all-expense-paid vacation to, to sleep all day. So I realize I can't keep doing this. I am so, at that point, I was really stressed. I mean, I'm always stressed, but at that point, I remember being stressed in particular because I was in a weird spot with my career. A bunch of stuff was not going the way that I wanted it to go, and so I was already really upset all the time. And um, so... I kind of, as I was trying to sleep, my gut started to tell me what I needed to do. And I need to, I always listen to my gut because it's never failed me, ever. And that's good advice for anybody. Listen to your gut. Um, I knew what I had to do. So the next morning I called the hospital people and I said, listen, if my partner wakes up, can you please tell them that I am done? I cannot do this anymore. You know, this is too much for me to handle. This is too much emotional baggage for me to deal with. Um, I think it would be best for both of us if we go our separate ways. So if they wake up, can you please tell them that? I hang up. And it was like an elephant had been sitting on my chest and it stood up and walked away and I could finally breathe. The relief that I felt in that moment, knowing that I was not going to have to deal with this anymore, I cannot even describe the euphoria that I felt. I was so happy because I think I realized in that moment that I was never happy with my ex to begin with, and this was just the last straw. So um, I decided this is yet another thing that I that everybody on social media seemed to have an issue with. Um I decided to go to the beach and remember, this is June in Los Angeles. So um, it, the seasons in coastal California don't really work the same way that they do for normal parts of the country. Um, so in June, it's actually pretty cloudy and cold all the time because of a phenomenon called the marine layer, um, which is the Pacific Ocean is a lot colder than the atmosphere becomes in the springtime. So that causes a layer of stratus clouds to form over the ocean and on land. Um, so if you get a sunny day in June, you have to enjoy it because the sun might not come out for another day or two. So I said, this, the sun is out, the birds are chirping, um, a huge weight has been lifted off my shoulders. I'm going to go to the beach. My, ish, my problem the mistake that I made was that I announced on social media that my partner was in the ICU and I told the hospital what my, they told me, that it was not looking good and they were likely not going to make it. I should have waited longer before I posted the next picture of me um at the beach. And I admit that that was a mistake timing wise, but I was kind of, you know, I had been on my phone for so long. I'm always on my phone. I'm a content creator. So I'm constantly checking social media and done, you know, it starts to fry your brain after a while. And so I said, I need to take a break from social media. I'm just going to get out everything that I want to post in five seconds. And then I'm going to turn my phone off for the rest of the, the day and not look at it. Um, the juxtaposition of both of those posts ended up causing a lot of problems for me later on as well. Um, but that day that I, that day in particular, the rest of that day was very, very enjoyable. I went to the beach and um, I heard through the grapevine that uh, my ex did pass 
later that day. I still don't even know what happened. Nobody's told me at this point what's happened yet, but remember, I don't really have any more of an obligation to them at this point than if some random, random, random stranger on the street. So um, it's not my first priority. And when people, people kept, kept texting me and saying, I'm so sorry about what happened, um, you know, and I would say, can you please, I don't want to talk about it. So it stopped. I blocked pretty much everybody's number who mentioned it. And I blocked my ex's number. I blocked all the hospital numbers because um, I was done. Or I thought I was done at least. But little did I know that everybody else was not done with me. Um, so went to the beach and then eventually I said, why do people have to just stroll right in front of the camera when I'm in the middle of doing a video. People think that they are all the center of the universe. This is something that my ex never understood either because I get into, you've probably been able to tell, I get in a fucking flow state and if somebody interrupts me in the middle of the flow, then I, I might have to start all over again. I'm going to try not to. This time, I'm going to try to just keep going, but that's just rude. If you see somebody filming a video in public, don't interrupt them. Go around them, or better yet, just turn around and do something else. I don't even remember what I was talking about. Okay, I was at the beach, and then I decided to take a little vacation once I heard the news that my ex had actually died because, you know, I, I, I just don't need to be reminded of it 24-7 with the scenery and, and being in our house that we used to share and all of that stuff. So I went on vacation in Mexico. And it was, I had a great time. You know, I was, I had a little sombrero. I know you're not really supposed to do that kind of thing anymore, but I, I thought it was fun. I don't know. And people down there didn't really care that much anyway. It's not like everybody's... Twitter isn't real life, people. So try to remember that next time you get all in a, in a hissy fit about some stupid crap that doesn't matter. I've been seeing people all week post about DoorDash. Who gives a fuck? Who? Okay, anyway. Sorry, I'm getting distracted again. I gotta back, get back in my flow state. Um, I go to Mexico. I have a great time. I land on the plane and I land in LAX. And as soon as I get out, I see airport security is there waiting with somebody who looks like the LA police department. And they say, Mr. Henschel, um, do you mind if we ask you a couple of questions about your ex? And honestly, the first thing I said was, who are you talking about? Because I had had such a great time that I, and on, I was still a little drunk, to be honest with you. So I didn't really remember exactly what they were talking about at first. And then of course, you know, it all came kind of crashing back. And I was like, oh yeah, that happened. So I said, okay, sure. Let's, you know, it's whatever. Let's clear whatever this is up. Um, not, stop. Stop fucking doing that. God, okay. Where was I? I'm all messed up. I'm, I'm, okay. hmm. The police take me in from the airport to interview me. Um, and they... Turns out it was the fucking hospital. Because remember the video that I mentioned earlier? Apparently my ex had... I guess, displayed symptoms that were very similar to sodium poisoning, which, you know, the symptoms of sodium poisoning are like you have a headache and you feel tired. So that's the symptom of every single fucking thing that could ever happen to the human body. So I really think the only th that they were doing this in retaliation to me, um, to me asking them to do their job they had a problem with that. I understand that doctors and nurses are all very overworked, um, you know, and so I don't blame them for having a problem with me because I'm, I'm sure that when I walked in there, um, I, here I am, Mr. Hollywood, big shot, you know, and they're probably thinking, if my life was that bad, I would resent anybody who reminded me of it as well. Um, people always act really weird and jealous and insecure around me because I remind them of their own failure. And I have to remember that when people treat me in a way that is odd or that I don't understand, I have to remember that's what it is. 
Um, but apparently they, you know, checked my social media and I guess they wanted a layup, you know? So they said, okay, let's bring this guy in and see what he did. Uh, see if we can get any more information. And this is one of the things that ended up going viral was my mug shot. This is different than the most recent mug shot that I posted of the, uh, um, tweet about the Oscars, which is a whole different story. Maybe I'll make a video about that. But this mugshot, remember, this is June 2023. Um, it was not quote unquote a mugshot. What had happened was, and I can see why everybody would get confused. That day, I had been wearing an orange shirt. And when I got to the police station, the police recognized me from TikTok and they told me they were fans of my content and they wanted to get a picture of me. That's it. It was not, a, I was not being arrested. Um, it was not any sort of situation like what everybody thought it was. But of course, the news media and all these people, they need a quick click because they're the death of print journalism has completely destroyed our culture. Um, so the New York Post or whoever it was, I don't, don't sue me, New York Post, if it wasn't you. I'm sorry. I don't remember exactly who ran it initially, but they ran an article about me and how um, the hospital staff, who, of course, they were just excited to get any attention from anybody because everybody is a media whore in Los Angeles. Um, they gave an interview where they said, they talked about my social media and said it was pretty clear that he did it because the symptoms lined up exactly with the video, supposedly, even though the symptoms in the video were very, very general. Um, and they use all of the stuff that I've mentioned in the story so far against me. They put that, they put both pictures side by side of me, um, saying that my partner was in the ICU and then me going to the beach. Um, they put the, all the TikToks that I made of, you know, me, uh, procrastinating going to the hospital and then going to get food, which is a biological necessity before going to the hospital. They use all of it against me because they are so good at doing that. They are so good at taking something that seems completely innocuous and then using it to crucify the person. Um, so I, this was not my first run in with the police and would not be the last. So I, once I kind of explained the situation to them, then they understood. Um, I showed the judge my TikToks and he, he loved it. He thought I was so funny. The one in particular that he really liked was the one about the judge who um, was really hangry and sentenced a guy to life in prison and then ate lunch and realized that it was too harsh and it was too late to do anything. He cracked up. He said, this is so me. You hit the nail on the head with this one. And that's really flattering, you know, when people, um, when people appreciate my work and I can kind of make them laugh and, you know, especially somebody like that who's important. Um, so I think that's the end of the story. I don't remember. I mean, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, it, 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 again, it's, it was an ordeal, but that's life. I mean, I've completely put it behind me. I got over it very quick. Um, and it sucked, but you know, life goes on. I mean, it, it affected, you know, kind of, uh, me in the sense that it stuck with me and I realized I need to be more careful about how I explain things to people on the internet because people tend to take things the wrong way. Um, but I think overall the story has kind of a positive ending because my mugshot going viral really increased my exposure at the time. Mm. So that news article kind of got me in front of a lot of more eyeballs than I otherwise would have. So net positive gain of the story. Um, and yeah, I mean, I rest in peace, I guess, but you know, I mean, I've moved on. I'm not in touch with my ex's family, but I, yeah, I don't know. Who cares? Uh, well, I'm sorry. That's a little insensitive. I guess grief, anybody who's experienced grief. I remember when my grandmother, when my grandfather died, my grandmother was so angry at him. And he used to say, you asshole, why the hell would you die on me like you did? And obviously she didn't actually not like him. And she loved him very much. It's just, that's how the grief was manifesting itself. So when I say these things that seem really callous, 
really that's just the way that grief is manifesting itself in me and everybody grieves differently. So, um, there it is. And, uh, that's the story. Um, so now, you know, kind of the background of my situations with the hospital and the fact that I keep seeming, I must be the unluckiest person in the whole world because I keep stumbling into these situations where people all around me are, are having some, something horrible happen to them. Um, so I don't know, maybe I just got to keep myself locked inside so that I don't, uh, have encounter anybody because everybody I come in contact with seems to die. <laughs> so, um, you know, life is good now. I'm in a much better place than I was in the last video I uploaded. So I appreciate everybody who reached out and said that I'm sorry, you know, you're doing a great job. Thanks a lot. That really means a lot to me, honestly. Um, don't forget to subscribe to my sub sub subscribe to my Patreon because um, I have a, a new episode of the podcast that I just up to, uploaded, the longest one that I've ever uploaded, and we have a Discord on there, which is kind of starting to pop off, so um, get on that shit, because I'm going to be adding a lot more stuff to it as well, so that's going to be a real treat for you. Um, have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye.